Aloha. Welcome to another discussion episode on a show called Hospitality Hawaii. I'm your host, John Kanching, and it gives me great pleasure every other week to bring in individuals, leaders, difference makers, and others who are engaged in our number one industry for the state of Hawaii, the visitor industry. <clears throat> so I am so happy that our guest agreed to be on our discussion today. His name is Eric Takahata. He's the Managing Director for Hawaii Tourism Japan. <clears throat> um, Eric's been a longtime friend and supporter uh, of me and of the industry through many, many years uh, during my time with the various companies I've been involved with. He's a key force in our largest international marketplace, uh, the Japan marketplace. And there's nobody more knowledgeable uh, about the Japan visitor and the market to Hawaii than Eric Takahata and his team at the Hawaii Tourism Japan. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome uh, Mr. Takahata. Eric. Wow, aloha, John. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I just want to you know, say thank you to you for the past probably almost 30 years that I've known you. You've uh, guided us um, and you've given us great um, leadership, you know, when you were in your roles, in your previous roles. And we're just so thankful to have um, people like you that led us in the industry. And uh, we look forward to a nice future with you as well. Hey, um, I, I appreciate those comments. And I'll tell you, nobody in this industry can do anything good unless they have great people working besides them and great partners like you and all the others. So uh, we've got a quick probably 27, 28 minutes. So, so I won't take up too much of my time talking, but, but maybe we can kind of set the stage. So pre-COVID 2019 was probably, uh, aside from obviously the, the peak years back in the late 90s, uh, it was a great year for Japanese visitors coming to Hawaii. I think you probably had 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 million Japanese visitors who arrived and stayed in Hawaii in 2019. Um, kind of fast forward, we went down to almost zero uh, or maybe zero in 2020. Uh, there's some tricklers of, you know, small numbers of people coming in. Um, they've had, they still have some flights. The good news is that there's, there's more flights being added. So maybe you can tell us where we are now and, and what you think is going to happen with your, your special crystal ball, say, in the next three or four months. Thanks, John. Yes, uh, man, 2019 was a great year, right, for, for tourism uh, overall into Hawaii. We had about 10.4 million total visitors into the state. Um, Japan accounted for about 1.56 million of those visitors in 2019. And we were churning like full steam ahead into 2020. Olympics was going to happen. We were going <laughs> to uh, yeah. feature surfing. Uh, first time ever surfing. A Hawaiian sport got included in the Summer Olympics. Um, we had a press conference in February. I mean, highly attended, highly widely covered in Japan on all major major TV stations about surfing, and um, and we were so excited for 2020. And what happened? COVID, and all of a sudden, like you mentioned, um, you know that 1.56 million Japanese visitors went down to almost zero. You're correct. As as soon as uh, March, April of last year, we were down to all no flights coming in you know, for the various situations. Um, and we got through 2020 pretty much like that. Um, there were stop-go kind of scenarios where Japan was going to open up. We had worked very hard with the Japanese government and our Hawaii government. Uh, a couple of key people, uh, Governor Ige, House Speaker Saiki, were very instrumental in helping us to negotiate a travel corridor, a travel bubble with Japan. And we had gotten it to a place where right around August of last year, we were going to be able to set something up with with Japan in a, in a travel corridor kind of scenario. But what happened, you know, the numbers started spiking right in the US and then the numbers started spiking in Japan. And that kind of rolled us into Q4 of last year and the numbers went crazy as we all know globally. And um, the travel corridor uh, discussion went away and we had to postpone and, and there were several stop go kind of situations like that in 2020. What's happened this year uh, in the first quarter um, we were hopeful that, uh, you know, that the, a lot of things with the vaccine and, and pre-testing and all that safe travels with Hawaii and Japan would be pretty much starting to roll and at a significant pace. But 
you know, as we see now in Japan, what's happening now, the vaccine rollout, a little slow currently. Um, right now, just about 1.6% of the Japanese population uh, vaccinated. Uh, but that's stepping up. It's, it's, you know, it's continuing to step up um, on the vaccine rollout. The procuring more vaccine, you know, we see good news uh, moving forward into the summer and into the fall of this year for vaccination uh, for the Japanese population and, and travel uh, along with that. So, you know, right now, you know, the, the flights are what it is. The uh, travel companies are where they're at right now, um, gearing up for when the Japanese will be able to more freely come back and forth between mainly Japan and Hawaii. So, you know, it's a ramp up uh, kind of period right now. And we're looking at Q3, Q4 to really start seeing uh, the numbers start to come in from back in from Japan again to Hawaii. So, so you would say that the, the two key factors in the Japan business coming back, one's got to be more, more Japanese consumers being vaccinated, right? And as you mentioned, the procurement of the vaccines itself seems to be stepping up as maybe a lot of the European countries and the U.S. have already got a good number of people that are being vaccinated. So I guess there's more uh, vaccines available for other countries. <clears throat> So, so that may be number one. Number two is probably got to be that 14-day quarantine, right? Yep. As the Japanese, as Japanese government themselves feel a little bit more comfortable with the rest of the world having a lot of vaccines, you know, a large percentage of the population being vaccinated. <clears throat> say America, let's like, say example, you've got 60% or 50% of Americans being vaccinated above the age of 16. Uh, you know, it's probably conceivable that Americans could travel to Japan in the not too distant future, right? Agreed, agreed. And man, boy, John, you you hit the uh, nail right on the head. Um, the main deterrent for the Japanese visitor coming back to Hawaii in any significant type of numbers is that 14-day quarantine that's they're, they're subjected to when they return to Japan, right? Now, what's important to understand here, and what I like to point out about the Japanese market, is that they don't they want you they want okay, vaccine is rolling up, but or specific to Hawaii travel, a lot of Japanese don't care if they're vaccinated or not. They will go through the pre-travel testing and you know safe travels and, and adhere to that. Mm -hmm. And as long as they don't have to do the two-week two quarantine, the 14-day quarantine when they return to Japan, all the surveys that we've taken in this last year show that a significant number of Japanese would come back um, if they didn't have to do the 14-day quarantine. So yes, vaccine is important. Um, as a nation, it's important for them. But it's not necessarily the main deterrent for them coming back to Hawaii. The main deterrent for the Japanese coming back to Hawaii is the 14-day quarantine that they're subjected to. So, so what do you think the big biggest hurdle with regard to getting that either uh, waived or reduced? You know, Korea, uh, I think, as you mentioned, and it was in the news lately, but the uh, uh, returning Korean residents, uh, I don't know if it's May or June, but soon they'll be exempt from from needing to have the uh, need to quarantine as long as they can show proof of a negative test, right? Um, yes. So interestingly enough, they chose Cinco de Mayo, right? May 5th to be the day okay. <laughs> that uh, actually fully vaccinated Korean residents that traveled abroad would be able to return to Korea from traveling abroad um, without the 14-day quarantine. And they also have to pr pr produce a negative PCR test as well, right? So Two things for the Koreans. If if um, they're fully vaccinated and they produce a negative PCR test upon arrival, they get exempted out of their 14-day quarantine. So that started on May 5th of this year. Um, and, and you know, we're hearing rumblings out of out of Korea, especially the, their um, travel. The travel ministry is also working very closely with uh, the Japan government to be able to start bringing back Japanese tours and Japanese back to Korea in, in, in you know, a big way. Because Korea great. is a very popular, uh, very popular destination for Japanese um, to travel to. And the Korean government is now working uh, very, very hand in hand with the Japanese government to make that happen sooner than, you know, later. OK, so, Eric, you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, that you felt there were a lot of Japanese customers or, or consumers that were willing to travel to Hawaii. But but they, um, you know, they're concerned about the 14 day quarantine. So so what's your backup? You know, how, how, how do you know that? That's uh, that's the case. So I, I think there's there's different surveys that that um, that have were done. Maybe you can share some of that information with us. Sure, um, I'd love to flash up the uh, latest JTB um, survey on on traveler sentiment or travel from Japan to Hawaii. 
Okay, 20% of the respondents. Now, this is a survey. We take, we, we've taken surveys uh, during the whole year, last year, um, every other month for traveler sentiment. And it's very reflective of this set of, set of data, which was from JTB uh, Research. And JTB is the largest uh, travel company in, in the world, right? So um, their numbers show that 20% of the respondents would return back their choice, the destination of choice, once they're able to travel abroad again, is Hawaii. And then when you look across the board, we take the same data and we slice it up by gender and age category, you, you see the same type of numbers across the board that unequivocally, uh, Hawaii is the destination of choice for the Japanese. Now, this data is very reflective of, of the data we were, uh, of the surveys that we were taking over the last year. This is, I think, about a, a sample size of about 2,200 uh, respondents. For the, our sample size uh, for our own surveys that we have through our databases is probably well over 10,000 respondents. So, um, but the numbers are the same is what I'm trying to say. And mm -hmm. uh, really encouraging to see that the, the tra uh, traveler, Japanese traveler sentiment uh, towards coming back to Hawaii is very high. And we are the destination, this destination of choice for them to come back to first. So, so in your conversations with Japanese travel companies and in, in the few conversations I've had with them, I, I think the growing, the sentiment is that once things, you know, um, governmental wise um, uh, become open, you know, with respect to the, the quarantine waiver or reduction, they think that the business is going to come back pretty quick. You feel that way as well? Oh, absolutely. And, um, and, and, you know, when you look back at history, historically for the Japanese traveler, every kind of uh, disaster that we've had in the Japanese market, right? Starting, we had SARS, we had we had uh, bird flu. We had 9-11, uh, right? 9-11. We had the great um, Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in right, 2011. Right. Um, we had the stock uh, market, world global financial markets crash, right, in 2000. After all those disasters or tragedies, you know, we see the following year, the Japanese market just rebounds uh, pretty quickly. And, and as we're seeing now, right, I mean, we do see the domestic market coming back in a nice way. But I would tell you that many of the hoteliers and stakeholders in Waikiki and the neighbor islands will tell you that until that international piece of business of Japan being the biggest market internationally, until that returns, and they're going to have a hard time returning uh, back to full staff, right. you know, so on and so forth, reopening in, in any significant kind of way. So, um, yeah, we're just, you know, the Japanese need to come back. And, and to your uh, question, we have historical data. We have current data from all of our airline partners, travel companies that, yes, they believe that once, you know, the restriction is lifted, that 14-day quarantine, that there will be a significant spike uh, in yeah, Japanese you, travel you, demand. You, you had a couple, or you have a couple more slides, right? And, and wasn't one of them about the airline seats or the airline schedule? Yes. So currently, um, when you, uh, this is what your air, current airlift looks like right now. So I can tell you through um, our research, HTA research, as well as DBED research, we get about just about 1,500, like you said at the opening of this uh, 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 time, right? You said that it's, mm -hmm. there's tricklers of, of Japanese coming in. So the tricklers that are coming in represent about 1,500 Japanese coming in uh, and on any month um, now recently. Uh, when you look at the air, air, air lift uh, situation, you see the airlines are providing 34, 35 flights a month. Mm -hmm. And with 8,400 to about 8,500, 8,600 seats per month. So that tells you, you know, the airlines are very committed to Hawaii. Hawaii is in their route networks, uh, uh, one of the best profit, um, prof most profitable routes that they have. So financially, economically, and as well as just because a lot of them have such a deep and long connection, you know, with, with Hawaii, they, they remain committed to this market, even though. It only represents 1,500, you know, Japanese visitors coming in now. They they, they leave about, on average, 8,500 seats in the market every month. So that kind of shows you their commitment as well. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And, and and as a destination, we're lucky to have partners like Japan Airlines, ANA, and all the other carriers that continue to have those flights, uh, even though they aren't the passengers there. So, um, you know, Eric. One of the things that's really important, um, and we didn't talk about this a little bit earlier, but I, but I know you're involved in it. You know, each county is doing their destination management activity or action plan, right? And a lot of it has to do with the, you know, what they call regenerative or sustainable tourism. 
Uh, in other words, making sure that the visitors that we have that are coming into the island, that we don't hit that 10 and a half million visitor mark in 2019, but, but the visitors that we do get are more sensitive, more culturally aware of the environment and the, the fragile nature of our resource. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and your feelings with respect to the Japanese visitor and how they might fit in with that, that direction? Sure. Um, you know, ever since John DeFries came on board as the new president CEO at HTA uh, late last year, um, the whole direction in that regenerative tourism has really been, you know, pumped up or amped up. Um, and the team at, at HTA, they're, they're, they work very hard, you know, and, and this is in response, John, to um, a resident sentiment survey that we are very uh, aware of, um, mm -hmm. where it's a survey taken, I think now once or well, no, more than once, twice, twice a year now, at least by HTA. And it shows, you know, resident sentiment towards tourism. And that, that sentiment is no big secret. It's been dropping, right? The residents are not happy with this many visitors uh, in, in, in their home. You know, their home, this is where they live, work and play. Uh, they're not happy. So, um, you know, that that just uh, prompted HDA to, to think about regener regenerative tourism, responsible tourism, what we like to call an HDA Malama. So the Malama initiative uh, was introduced by John and, and adapted by all of us, the, uh, you know, global contractors and every market. And it is, it, it does speak to what you say. We want to bring back the visitor. Yes, we need visitors to come back in a strong way, but we need to bring the visitor back in a pono way, right? In Hawaii, we say pono. We want them to come back in the right way. So that is kind of, if I had to boil it down to its essence, the Malama um, initiative that's being uh, initiated right now by HDA. The DMAP um, plans that you're talking about is an extension of Malama. It is one thing that we are trying to do to actively engage each county, each island, to have resident community feedback into the things that we do as HTA. And when I say we, it means the mothership HTA as well as all of their contractors, right, globally, to make sure that we are sensitive when we do market this beautiful, wonderful place to, to our, our markets, that we're doing it in a very responsible way, a malama way to take care. And we want to form, for example, Japan, we say we want to, we want to create the, a more Pono travel. And you know, Japanese um, historically have been very respective of the Hawaiian culture. Um, they are very compliant uh, in general. Um, you tell them wear a mask, they wear a mask. You know, you tell them don't do this, don't do that. And 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 as you know through your 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 long career, you've seen that um, upfront and personally too that they're quite right. compliant. So um, as far as the market goes, you want the Japanese visitor to come back as quick as possible because they're already kind of your pono traveler. Mm -hmm. It just takes now a little more education on maybe more natural resources and how to be a little bit more responsible when they come back. But uh, for our market, it's something that's kind of an easy pitch. Um, and, uh, you know, they are the regenerative tourists that we, you know, visitors that we want back in Hawaii. They're higher spending, very uh, are respected. They respect our Hawaiian culture and respectful of our natural resources as well. Oh, well said, you know, very well said, because, you know, I remember reading pre-pandemic that even in Japan, there were, there were a lot of issues there. There were growing resident sentiment against visitors from all over the world because places like Kyoto and some of the other uh, maybe less traveled places in Japan were now being overrun by visitors from all over the world. And a lot of it became, you know, as a result of the popularity of all the different social media channels. Um, and so I, I know different places in Japan and, and elsewhere around the world were, were starting to put restrictions against visitors or Kind of like what the state of Hawaii did with Hanama Bay and what they want to do with some of the other hot spot, you know, um, um, resources around the islands. But, hey, let, let's switch gears a little bit. Maybe you can talk about during this last 12 months or six months, what type of activities have you and your team been engaged with to keep Hawaii top of mind, even though obviously we know people can't travel? And then what are some of your thoughts about once things start going, what do you have in the pipeline to to really hit the market, you know, hard and fast to to make sure we're maximizing our coverage and people know that hey, it's um, it's safe to travel to Hawaii. There's lots of flights um, and so forth and so on. 
Right. So during the lockdown, right, during that whole last year, what we were doing was um, was real, what was really important for any other destination as well was to keep engaged with the Japan market. And Japanese don't forget so quickly. They know um, people who want them and people who do not want them. And, and you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But um, so for us, it was very important for, as a destination, as Hawaii, as the top destination to remain the top destination in the Japanese you know, um, consumer psyche, right, in their mind. So we relied heavily on digital. Um, we attacked it from one, the travel trade. So we were constantly engaged with the travel trade, our JTVs, our HISs, our Japan Airlines, our ANAs. Um, and we had weekly almost get together seminars. Seminars would last anywhere from 30 to minutes to two hours. We would do um, updates on COVID, um, what was happening with the pandemic here in Hawaii specific to Japan, um, we created a whole very, very um, robust website called um, uh, in, within our allhawaii.jp website about COVID. And really, um, we're asked by a lot of uh, even Japanese government organizations that they were able to use that for Hawaii, you know, to kind of show the Japanese consumer what it's like um, if they need to come to Hawaii or what it's like right now in Hawaii. And we were happy to share that with them. So, you know, engagement in the Japanese market is highly important and you have to stay top of mind, right? So we use a lot, a lot of digital platforms. Social media was through the roof, right? And we, we, we relied on a lot of digital platforms. So we'll continue that. Um, digital is, is, I don't care what any market, uh, is super important for engagement. And once, you know, once we start churning with everybody's going to start, um, the, the, the travel companies, the airlines are going to start marketing now on about Q3, right, to try to capture the year end. Um, we hope to be hand in hand with them for the recovery of the market because, um, you know, they, they're all asking us to be with them to message the Japanese consumers. You know, the, the HDA, HDJ is, is a vital part of what they do. Um, you know, the bureau, um, what they call us in Japan, the bureau. They need the bureau with them um, on this. And as a destination, we couldn't agree more. So we have some things in the, in the works right now. We're right now kind of in a, a holding pattern. Um, on, on what we can do. And, you know, we're working through that with HTA and, and everyone else. But once that's worked through, we hope to be able to be hand in hand with the stakeholders in Japan to welcome the Japanese back towards Q3, Q4 this year. Yeah, well, well I'll tell you, you know, the, the Waikiki and Oahu desperately need the Japanese visitors. Um, you know, maybe not so much the neighbor islands. And, and you know, while, while Japanese visitors did go to the neighbor islands and and different uh, travel companies made concerted efforts to get more people to travel to islands or spend some time in uh, the Big Island or Maui. Um, you know, and, and they've had growing success. <clears throat> the numbers are are well, well below the numbers that actually come and stay in Oahu. And, and I think we know the reason why, because of their shopping, the diversity, so forth, all the, the action and all the ac activities that are available on this island. Um, you know, just a, uh, a a small tidbit here. You know, I just had lunch the other day at uh, at a, a very popular restaurant, and in the uh, Rohan Shopping Center. And it normally pre COVID time would. I was talking to a waiter. He said we would have 450 people a day from different Japanese travel companies having lunch, and on any given night they would have 850 dinners at this popular restaurant a night. And um, there were only two tables uh, occupied during lunch. So it just shows how important having the Japanese customer in because, because the American customer, who, who obviously everyone loves to have, and, and we're glad to have as many of them as we can, they, they kind of tend to just disappear, right? They'll stay in the hotel, <clears throat> check in, and then a lot of times they're traveling all around the island where, where that Japanese customer I think does more to patronize a lot of the, the different shops, restaurants, uh, other activities in and around Honolulu and Waikiki. So, so for Waikiki, it's, it's tremendously important. Um, what was that other slide that you had, Eric? You had one more, one more slide, didn't you? Yeah, I think, I think people were wondering, um, we get this asked all the time, so what are other people doing? What are other destinations doing in Japan to grab this very um, desirable traveler, right, from Japan? And, um, and, and this is what we were able to gather uh, for our last uh, marketing meeting, last month's marketing meeting uh, for mm -hmm. HDA. 
But um, we see now, um, and and just recently we we heard rumblings out of Korea, as 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 close as yesterday that they're going to go full bore after the Japanese, and they want the Japanese come come back to Korea full force. So the Japanese Korean government is going to do a lot of uh, initiatives. They're going to do a heavy marketing campaigns in Japan. They're also going to um, work with the various travel companies and mm-hmm. incentivize them as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting that Japanese visitor to come back pretty quick. Just a smattering of, of what other destinations are doing, you know, big promotions. Um, we weren't able to get a lot of the budget numbers except for Hong Kong, which is going to pour in about $145 million. Uh, into marketing to Japan and, and and the situation in Hong Kong, right? I mean, not the most uh, positive things happening in Hong Kong with the uh, protests and all, and all of that, all the bad press they were getting. But they understand that the Japanese visitor uh, for them is highly important. And at one time, uh, you know, they they had a, a large share of Japanese visitors going to Hong Kong. But uh, for them to, you know, come out and say they're going to spend $145 million to go get the Japanese back is a pretty bold move by them. And um, these other destinations are, are really just spending um, big money and marketing back, you know, to the Japanese to get them back, or either they're, you know, kind of, and they won't tell us to, to our face, but we know right. anecdotally that they're trying to steal them away from us, right? Because yeah. we're the number one destination. Now, I noticed yeah. you didn't. I noticed you didn't have Guam on that. Yeah. Guam, on that list now, Guam. Guam obviously is a very, very popular, maybe shorter haul vacation spot for Japanese customers, right? Um, they weren't on the list at the time because they were just completely not doing anything. <laughs> um, but we did, we recently last week found out that Guam Visitors Bureau um, is going to launch um, some major promotions and campaigns in Japan. Like you said, shorter haul, about three and a half hour flight from Tokyo uh, to Guam. Um, right, less than half, right, uh, that it takes to yeah. fly to Hawaii. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they've always been <laughs> competing with us on the sand and surf and and the retail is pretty pretty good too in Guam too. So you know, the, the, definitely the, all these other destinations are after the Japanese. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, well. I know you can't speak to it, Eric, and, and I and I won't I won't uh, put you on the hot seat. But you know, lately, if anyone's been listening to the news or reading the newspaper, uh, and anybody who's involved in the in our visitor industry know that there's been a lot of press about about the Hawaii Tourism Authority budget. Um, Different bills are passed, et cetera. And now I know it's on Governor Ige's desk waiting for it to either be signed or vetoed or whatever the case might be. Um, and however it turns out, we just need to make sure that the Hawaii Tourism Authority, and especially Hawaii Tourism Japan, where you have one of your highest spending visitors that's coming to the state and also a very respectful and um, sustainable visitor, the, the ideal customer that we want, that that the organ, the marketing teams, whether it be Hawaii Tourism Japan or HTA Total, has the necessary funds to be able to make the impactful marketing and promotion in Japan, and be able to plan long term. And I think that's one of the bigger issues about the HTA. You know, the funding issue is that if every year the Hawaii Tourism Authority has to go to the legislature to get funding for that next year, very difficult to make long term plans. And, and we know that in the travel market. You have to be able to make long-term plans in order for it to be successful. <clears throat> so, so on that note, you know, I won't put you on the spot, but just know that there are a lot of people that are supporting um, not just Hawaii Tourism Japan, but all the markets, making sure that we have the right amount of funds. And there's accountability involved as well, uh, which is a key point. Uh, but I want to thank Eric Takahata, the Managing Director for Hawaii Tourism Japan, for sharing 30 minutes of his time, his mana'o, his, his experience, his knowledge on that Japan market. I think that that market is gonna come back very strong. Now, it, it, it might take six months or it might take a little bit more or it might be less, you, you just never know. Uh, but, but it'll be good overall for economy. It'll get a lot of people back working. So thank you very much for your time, Eric. We really appreciate it. And I'd love to have you back maybe six months from now when things have happened and, and we get a better perspective over now what, right? How do we manage this thing moving forward? So thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. So um, for everybody here, uh, it's been great having everybody on, on another episode of Hospitality Hawaii. We look forward to our, our next guest, whoever that might be in the next two weeks. Until then, hui ho, be safe, and thank you very much. Aloha. <laughs>